I'm gonna mute you guys while I go through cats. There's also banging going on in my house too. <laughs> you probably pick up on that too. I decided to have some work happen here today. So. Uh, this is Dia de los Muertos direct to video. Um, I'm gonna do CATS, that stands for concept, aim, tone, and subject matter. So concept, we are playing um, a special session of a big series that I call Dia de los Muertos. It's something that we normally run uh, in the gauntlet um, for Halloween, but I was feeling it um, <laughs> uh, now, and so I wanted to do it now. The idea behind Dia de los Muertos is you use the final girl and cheat your own adventure to tell the story of almost the entire saga of a film franchise called Dia de los Muertos. In fact, the first, um, the first movie and the second movie are done with Final Girl, and then movies three, four, and five are done today with Cheat Your Own Adventure, and then um, we skip six and seven. I have no idea whatever happens in six and seven and eight, and we go straight to number nine for Alien versus Porkface, which is the science fiction version of Dia de los Muertos. Um, someday we'll do six, seven, and eight, maybe. I don't know. Um, in any case, cheat, that, that's the deal. Cheat Your Own Adventure, the game we're playing today, is, um, for those of you who've never played it, it is a, it uses the metaphor, I guess, or the idea of like a Cheat Your Own Adventure book to tell um, a pretty, pretty self, like pretty small stories, right? So the way it works is, if it's my turn as the reader, I describe what's happening in the story in the second person. So I say, you walk down a hall, you turn left, you do this, you do that. And then once I get to a decision point, once I get to a little like a little crossroads point, then you each in turn will say, um, you'll give me some options. So you'll say, well, if you do this, you turn to page 55 and you just make up a page number. The page numbers don't matter. If you do this, go to page 14. If you do this, go to, you know. And so then you all present your options. I choose whichever one I like best. Um, if I chose yours, you roll some dice to see if it was successful. And if it was, then you narrate, um, you narrate the next part of the story. If it wasn't successful, then you uh, narrate the fail condition or the fail state. And in most games of Cheat Your Own Adventure, it means that the character dies. But for Dia de los Muertos, the three Cheat Your Own Adventure games that we play each have a, a, different, um, a different fail condition. And so, um, for example, in the first one, if the role is failed, then you have to narrate the uh, the protagonist becoming the wife of Satan, okay, the bride of Satan. So that's Cheat Your Own Adventure. It's very easy. Uh, it's super easy to learn. It's nothing to get too stressed about. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, and, Jason. I'm sorry to cut you off. My internet was weird. Hopefully it's better now, but I've missed like basically everything you said for the introduction. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, it's okay. Um, well, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up. It's no big deal. Um, just if, if you... If you've like done any reading in preparation for this, you should be okay. But otherwise, we'll we'll catch up as as we go. Don't worry about it. Um, okay. My my they, internet is still like on and off, and I don't know why. My sp speed test looks like it's going fine. I don't know why. I, it's like kind of goes in and out for me. I'm not sure what's uh, happening. I, I just I recommend going on audio only. Uh, that usually uh, spares bandwidth, and it and it usually makes your stable okay. connection more stable. So and you can do that by just scrolling up. Uh, no where is that? <laughs> <coughs> is there a second? Does that mean just turning off my camera, or does that mean like um, yeah, turning off everybody's you'll just, video? You'll just um, hover up. You'll see a little gear, and then you'll see um, click on that, and you should have like a little camera thing up top. You'll uh, from there you will pick. Um, you should be able to pick like, or no, I'm sorry, the, the hover over. There's a little camera thing. Yeah, just click on that. Yeah, you're you're set. So that's good. Um, can you still hear us? Uh, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. That, that should make you more stable. Um, okay. We'll catch you up on what, what I said earlier. Don't worry about it for now. Okay. So the aim for today is we are going to um, we are going to uh, after this little intro, we're going to take a really tiny, quick, fast break, and then we're going to come back and we're going to begin the first uh, story. We will play through three stories. We should be done in plenty of time. Um, tone for today is. Um, it varies depending on which one we're doing, but it, it varies between like 
dark and kind of gothic for the first one. The second one is kind of more of a, like a straight horror story. Um, and then the third one is really surreal and like strange. So uh, that's kind of the deal there. Um, as far as uh, subject matter goes, I don't anticipate anything particularly gnarly happening subject matter wise. The first one does feature a protagonist who is being forced to marry Satan against her will. Um, so I suppose there could be like an implication of like some kind of occult, you know, sexual assault or something going on, but like all that stuff will stay off screen, right? Like, cause we uh, don't- Jason, sorry to yeah. interrupt again. I'm That's so, good. I'm. it looks like my router is doing something weird where my router is actually turning on and off. I think I'm, I'm gonna try power cycling. So I'm gonna come back in five minutes or okay, hopefully sure. less. I'm really sorry. No worries, no worries. Okay, bye. Um, so then, uh, what was I saying? Okay, yeah, so subject matter wise, I don't anticipate it being too gnarly because even like on the fail state of the first one, when you become the bride of Satan, we just see the point when she becomes the bride of Satan, right? And then it like kind of cuts away. In any case, um, in all cases, the X cards on the table, if something happens that someone's like, it's making someone uncomfortable in an unfun way, uh, just stop. And um, you can type X card into Roll for Your Party if you want, uh, if we're even using that, it's up to you. Um, because some people like to roll privately for this game, just to, for tension or whatever. Um, and then otherwise uh, you can just like type it in the chat or just say X card and we'll stop and we'll fix whatever it was. Um, so that is the deal with this. We'll give Walter a minute to get sorted. Um, do you guys have any questions about anything so far? I know that was a lot, but... Um, I hadn't thought about secret rolling. That's pretty exciting. It's pretty cool, yeah. yeah. So um, I prefer to do it secret. Um, I roll like, uh, I'm gonna have two, two D6 with me and on, at my, like, just in front of me. And then you roll it secretly. And if you, if you fail, you kind of like don't reveal it until you narrate the failure, right? So um, I might have to go grab some dice for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, it, we've, it's, some, cool. it's it's a hack. It's some, it's definitely a hack, right? That's not how the game is as written, but um, it's fun. So that's slick, though. I'm gonna grab some. I'll be right back. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll just take our break now. We'll give Walter a few minutes to come back, and then we'll get going. Okay. Hey, welcome back. Hey, uh, things look more stable now. I think I'll be better. Cool, awesome. We're just taking a quick short break before jumping into the first one. OK. Um, yeah, I don't think you you missed a whole lot. Um, we were just going through like rough game overview. The mechanics are basically kind of non-existent. Um, I don't know, where did you drop out at? Basically, at the very beginning, like I was having trouble hearing what Jason said from the beginning of his intro. Okay. So I pretty much missed everything. Uh, I can try to give you a quick <laughs> rundown. Uh, we'll be okay. doing three different movies, basically, using this game where we'll do like three little mini sessions. Okay. Um, and they're kind of like horror ish. Uh, the mechanic is roughly, like the, the super short version of the mechanic is you start a narration for a scene and get to a point and then you ask everyone else to essentially contribute a 
like a next step option. So it's like turn to page 52 to do this or that. Okay. Um, and then you get to pick the most interesting one, narrate it. Uh, you roll dice to see whether it's successful or not, basically, whether you fail completely. And if you fail, you use a specific failure option that's listed in the uh, each each of these sessions have a specified failure rule that's in the uh, PDF that Jason linked. Okay. Okay. Nice. That's and the person the, who's narrating like rolls the dice. I mm, I'm trying to remember exactly. I've I haven't had a chance to play this before. Okay. Someone so when you narrate, ask. you get to pick which of those options you like the best, and then that person rolls the dice. Got it. And oh. you either say if you were successful or not, but either way, you describe whatever's going on. Well, if you, in, in using the hidden one, hidden way that we're doing it now, you don't actually say whether or not you're successful. You just describe what happens. And if you were unsuccessful, then you're going to describe whatever the failure condition was. Okay. So okay. it's the person who suggested the option that picks up the narration. Okay, nice. I got a chance to glance at the rules, so it uh, makes makes pretty good sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Catch on. Also, it's easy. And then one piece that should be followed up on that is, uh, if it was a failure, um, then uh, you cheat. It'll throw back. <laughs> right, you'll cheat. You throw back to the person who made the choice, and they get to choose somebody else, and that one succeeds automatically. Okay. Nice. Okay, Doug. Uh, Brian, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. I'm just uh, still playing with this webcam. That's okay. Yeah, you don't sweat too much. It's fine. Okie doke. Um, so, all right. So you guys want to go ahead and pop open the, um, if you want to follow along, you can pop open the PDF of Blood 2. We'll kind of um, go through it real quickly. So the first movie we are doing is Dia de los Muertos 3. So the first Dia de los Muertos film tells this number one, tells the story of um, tells the story of a group of kids on this little kind of like local party island, like where weddings and stuff happen. Uh, they all get massacred by this woman. Uh, named Janice Griggs, um, and Janice Griggs, uh, she has like a an axe to grind against the town, and she um, is getting her revenge by murdering its children. Very like classic kind of like Friday the Thirteenth slasher flick situation, right? Um, she wears a rubber pig mask, and in the media in the fan base uh, surrounding the film. Uh, she refers to herself, or she's referred to as Porkface, but in the movie, she's only ever referred to as Janice. You know, in the movie, they don't call her Porkface, right? In any, in any case, she kills them all. Uh, the second film, just like uh, in Halloween 2, it picks up immediately after um, the first movie. And so the survivor of our first Diodolus Muertos film was uh, a rich kid named Niles. Um, he manages to get off the island he shows up at his family's uh, mansion where they're getting ready to have like a big fancy swanky dinner party. Uh, they think he's just like on drugs or something when he tries to explain to them that like everybody was killed and they kind of put him in his room. They have their fancy party. Porkface shows up, Janice shows up and she murders people. Um, that was the second movie. The third movie, the producers of the Dia de los Muertos franchise decided to... Um, they decided to take a different route. And so the third movie has nothing to do with Porkface. It is about a young woman named Claudia. So this is from the back of the DVD case for Dia de los Muertos 3, Season de la Bruja. A talented dancer has been accepted to a school for gifted young women. What will she do when she discovers the school's true purpose to find a suitable bride for the Dark Lord Satan? Season de la Bruja tells the story of Claudia, a gifted dancer attending the prestigious Lombardi School in Rome. It turns out the Lombardi School is actually run by a coven of witches, and their goal is to find and groom an exceptional young woman to be Satan's bride. Um, on a failed roll, 
you have to narrate Claudia becoming the bride of Satan and depending on where she's at in the story, possibly giving birth to the Antichrist. So that is our situation and setup for the first movie. I will be the first reader for, and the, the, my text is right here and, and it's for scene one. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. Oh, and we also need to establish a turn order as well. Um, I'm going to type a turn order in the chat here. So I will be back in like 30 seconds. I think this is going to fix the camera. One second. All right, go for it. You're going to have to retype that when he comes back. Right. You could possibly put it in the Hangouts chat instead. That's not a bad idea, huh? Hey, there you are. Oh. Okay, so I'm, I'm just putting up um, an order that will be going in whenever um, we give options. So. You'll want to just pay attention to whoever whoever's before you, basically. So whenever they go, you're you're, you're next. Um, Brian, you're going to be the first person up as soon as I'm done narrating. Um, yeah, and then there's also going to be a tracker. We need a tracker for the um, difficulty number. I'll just keep that running in the chat too. Difficulty is one. So. Uh, goes up to 12, and it'll all make sense as we start playing. Scene one. I get to read mine. You guys have to make yours up. You've been at the Lombardi School for several weeks now. Most days are pretty boring. Classes, dance practice, etiquette lessons, more classes, more dance practice. But lately you have started to notice strange things an unusual number of black cats turning up on the school's steps, weird noises like whispered voices coming from the vents, and several crosses that have been turned upside down. Tonight, as you're about to get ready for bed, you were disappointed to find that the girls from the East Wing are using your wing's lavatory, as theirs is having some plumbing issues. It was too crowded for your taste, and so you decided to use the small bathroom near the faculty lounge. As you approach that small, out-of-the-way bathroom, you hear some strange noises coming from the faculty lounge. Singing, possibly, or chanting. Yes, definitely chanting. And it's getting louder and louder. What do you do? And so at this point, Brian, you would just say, if you X, Y, Z, turn to page, <clears throat> whatever. OK. Um, if you approach the faculty lounge and press your ear up against the, the door to try to listen. Pre turn to page 50. If you pretend you didn't hear anything and go to brush your teeth, Turn to page 72. If you decide to hide in the janitorial closet across from the lounge and peek out the door, turn to page 83. If you bend over at the waist and peer into the skeleton keyhole to see what lies beyond in the faculty lounge, turn to page 66. If you take out your phone and record the chanting and send it to Shazam, turn to page 39. You're muted, Walter. OK, I'm sorry. Am I on? Uh, uh, if you. 
take the cigarette out of your pocket that Jane gave you earlier today and light it up to have a smoke. Turn to page 239. Lots of good options there. Um, so I wanna in insert real quickly before I pick that uh, in this game, you can pass. Like if you just can't think of anything, you can just say, oh, I pass. And it's no judgment or anything. Just, you know, sometimes nothing's happening. You're just nothing's coming and you can pass. Um, I'm going to go with, uh, Kevin, I, I remember liking yours. What was it again? Uh, that's hiding in the janitorial closet. Yeah, yeah, across uh, from uh, the yeah, there were, yeah, it was either that or the cigarette, but I'm going to go to the janitorial closet. So I'm just going to be real deliberate about the rules until we get the hang of it. Um, so now what Kevin's going to do is he's going to take 2d6. Uh, if you've got 2d6 handy, you can do, roll them. Otherwise, we can get you a die roller if you, if you need that. Um, he The difficulty is currently one. Um, and um, he's going to roll 2d6. As long as he doesn't um, roll lower than a one, He uh, uh, the, the choice is successful. Uh, the first two choices are always successful because you can't. You could because until you get to three, you can't actually fail. So, but just for um, you know, if you just want to roll dice, Kevin, by all means. Yay! I, I rolled you. greater than one. Awesome. Please continue the story. As you hide in the janitorial closet, the sound of the chanting grows louder and louder. Was that a scream you just heard? Or was it just someone really excited? You hear footsteps coming down the hall. What do you do? If you creak the door open slowly and silently to try to get a glimpse at who's coming down the corridor, roll the turn the page 60. Oh, to be clear, it would have been Michael's turn because Michael comes oh, up okay. Kevin, but you know, it's fine. But you're, you're, you're covered, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you uphold the tradition of making love in this particular janitorial closet, pretend to rattle the door so that you're not disturbed. Uh, continue to page 17. Oh, am I up? Are you, I'm sorry, were you saying? No. Oh, sorry, I guess it's me, isn't it? Sorry. The, um, if, the, uh, if the dust in the closet uh, is getting to you so badly that uh, you end up sneezing, turn to page 111. If you lock the door and wait quietly as you can, turn to page 43. If you reach down and pet the little black cat that is also in the closet with you, turn to page 61. I think I want to turn to page 111 and sneeze and see what could possibly go right. So your uh, allergies get you into trouble once again. And you, unfortunately, uh, you don't have a particularly petite sneeze. Uh, you have a outrageously loud sneeze, which you picked up thanks to your dad. Um, so uh, you try to stifle it, but you know that's not going to work. So you just let out this gigantic sneeze. And you hear the footsteps stop. And you also hear the sounds across the hall stop, the chanting. And you wait. 
and you see slowly that the small narrow space between the door and the jam is becoming occluded and you see a large bloodshot eye staring back at you. What do you do? That's Walter. Um, if you completely lose control and you burst out of the door and attempt to flee, turn to page 406. If you pick up the cat and throw it at the person in the door frame, turn to page 12. You took my turn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Somebody, you guys might want to just put that note somewhere on your, like on, a, on somewhere else on your computer. Uh, and DC is three, by the way. I'm sorry, but what did you say, Kevin? I was... If you pick up the cat and throw it at the person looking through the door, turn to page 12. If you if you quite suddenly wake up safe in your bed, rattled from the stream you just had, turn to page 19. If you grab the janitor's mop and stab at the eye, turn to page 90. If you, as quickly as you can, hide underneath a box that is in the, cl the closet, turn to page 74. If you politely greet your floor supervisor with a curtsy, uh, turn to page 83. Go the new heart direction. Let's go with uh, waking up from the dream. All right, so this is the first roll where I could actually fail because it's three. Oh my God, you exclaim as you wake up, your chest beating. Oh, it was just a dream. You lay back down. How ridiculous. The faculty, devil worshipers, witches, that's completely absurd. You're clearly just feeling the pressure of being away from home in a strange land. This is nothing like the farm you grew up in on Iowa, that grew up on in Iowa. Nothing like it. And so you pull the covers back over you and begin to nod off. Except there is a pawing. A pawing, no, a scratching near the foot of your bed. You bend over, turn on your night lamp. Your roommate snoring away. And there's a little black cat scratching on the bedpost. What do you do? And Brian's you. Um, if you take the cat and pull it close to you and look at the strange symbols on its collar, turn to Sage 60. If you 
jump out of bed, startled, and wake your roommate in a panic, turn to page 95. If you look at the cat and ask it, there's not really any sort of evil chanting and devil worship going on around here, is there? Turn to page 69. If you shoo away the cat and have difficulty falling back to sleep, uh, just turn to the next page. If you stare at the cat for a moment or two, and then it says to you in a low baritone voice, don't worry, you can go back to sleep. Turn to page 33. If you recoil in horror from some strange feeling that creeps over you as the cat leers into your eyes, turn to page 82. Many fine options. I'm going to go with the slowly ramping horror of looking at the symbol on its collar. So Brian, it's you, your difficulties four. So you uh, a bit startled to, to see the cat and uh, you coax it up onto your bed and uh, it seems a bit startled. You, you, you start to pet it and you notice it's got this um, black collar with, with red symbols um, scrawled across it. And as you start to look at them, they're not in any script you recognize. And you, you, you reach out and you touch one of them. What happens? Well, you should. You have to present it as a sort of like, um, like what do you do kind of thing. Like okay. Um, have there be some tension and say what do you do, or like a decision to make. Um. Okay. Say. These the symbols. Um, they they remind you of of some of the, the strange graffiti that you'd seen scrawled in the school bathrooms. Um, and uh, they, they seem to almost draw you in. Uh, you, you, you want to uh, study them and it's hard to rip your eyes away, but uh, you, you feel yourself getting lost in them. <clears throat> if you feel like these symbols look very familiar, like that strange graffiti written in a circular pattern around the border of the faculty bathroom, turn to pay, and you decide to, 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 to return there to take a closer look. Turn to page 29. If you give in to the sensation coursing through you as you stare at the symbols and see what lies beyond, turn to page 37. I think you got skipped again, Jason. 
Uh, no, it was Brian it was, Me it was, Kevin. It was, it was, Kevin. It was next. Chris after the reader, and then yeah, right. So it's Kevin. No. Okay. Oh yes. If you mutter the first words that swim up into your consciousness as you look at these unusual symbols, turn to page eleven. Hmm. If you reach for the Bible in your nightstand drawer to ward against this terrifying feeling, turn to page 99. If you realize that the words on the collar that appear to be ringing in your ears are actually being spoken by your roommate. Turn to page 112. Uh, and I'll go. Um, if you. Uh, those are all really good. I'll pass. Oh, man. There's some great options. Um... I think I'm going to go with my chanting roommate. DC's five. All right. You turn your head towards your roommate, who previously had been fast asleep and snoring. And you can see that she is still asleep still lying on her back, where normally she'd be snoring, but instead her mouth is speaking strange incantations that you just know match the words on the collar of the cat. And it is at that point that you hear, you notice that uh, once again, the crappy lock on your door has failed to close completely, and the door slightly opens ajar, and another black cat comes in with the same collar, and then a third one and a fourth one, and eventually there are about 17 of them perched all around your room, staring at you, listening to your roommate chanting. What do you do? So Walter's up. Okay, this time I'm actually next. <laughs> Sorry about the order last time. <clears throat> If you give in to the uncontrollable urge to join along with your roommate in the chanting, turn to page 52. If you give in to the urge to lay down in the middle of the room and allow the cats to nibble on every part of your body, turn to page 69. If you take the cat you're holding and throw it at your roommate, turn to page 110. If you grab the nearest piece of clothing you can find and jam it in your roommate's mouth to make the chanting stop, turn to page four. If you kick the cat that's nearest to you and run out of the room, turn to page 72. 
if you reach into your nightstand for your Bible to <laughs> bring you comfort when you're feeling this terrible emotion, turn to page 99. We're throwing the cat. DC is six. Who was that? Oh, it was me. Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so you you take the cat and just thrust it towards your roommates and uh, it's this screeching as it uh, kind of claws their face a bit and, and there's some blood dripping down their face, but they don't stop chanting. And uh, more cats are entering the room um, and uh, they, they form a, a, a circle on the ground and the blood dripping from your uh, roommate's face as it hits the floor, uh, these symbols light up across the floor, and uh, a uh, dark presence has suddenly felt in the room. Do I, do I narr narrate the whole thing to declare? You take as far as, I assume that was a fail. Yeah, it was a fail. Yeah, you take as far as you want, and then the story's yeah. over, and we, but we cheat and go back. <laughs> uh, and the... Uh, Dark, dark presence. Uh, you, you, it, it's something uh, beyond your comprehension, but you feel it reach out and touch your mi mind and take possession over you. All right, Shane, thumb in the thumb in the book. <laughs> you go back. Mm -hmm. I'm going to reach for my Bible. Wow, we got to the moral of the movie right away. Yeah, and just so everybody's clear <laughs> what's happening in the rules, because Brian failed the role, he had to narrate the Bride of Satan fail state. Uh, but Shane cheated, went back to the original page, chose a different one, and this one will be successful. So go ahead, Michael. So you reach into your nightstand, grab your old red leather-bound Bible. Um, hasn't got a lot of reading time, but there's always one of these nightstands at this pool. Um, even when you take it out, somehow they get placed back in there. Fortunately enough, as you grab it and hold it in your hands, the meowling from the cats gets louder, hissing, agony. And uh, your roommate, in fact, bolts upright in the bed, turns to you and her eyes are rolled back into her head and she's chanting louder and louder, but you're able to get out of bed and walk towards the door. And even as your roommate gets out of bed and stares at you, again, with the milky white of the back of her eyes, uh, they're, they're not able to get within three feet of you. Um, and you're able to make your way to your door and you grab the handle and twist and the room goes silent. Your roommate is back in their bed asleep. The cats are gone and you step out into the hallway, have opportunity to decide where you want to go from here. If you decide you need to take uh, a little bit of a break, from all of this, uh, but you decide to do that in a really stupid way, and you take that uh, little uh, smiling face piece of paper that uh, your friend gave you back home and you put it on your tongue. Turn to page 137. You cut out really ever so briefly, Shane, but basically Shane said, if you take LSD, then turn to that page. <laughs> All right, well Let's see. Okay, I'm up. Uh, 
if you decide to go down to the headmistress's chambers and wake her to let her know that you can no longer stand your roommate's horribly annoying chanting all evening, turn to page 28. If this story is taking place in the 1980s and you go out to the payphone just outside the school's gate and call back to the farm in Iowa, turn to page 19. If you get on your uh, school computer and, and start researching the, the symbols that you saw on the cat's collar, Turn to page 80. You should have said, if this story takes place post-1998 oh. and you go on your computer instead. <laughs> if you hold the, your Bible against your chest and work your way over to the faculty wing to go use the faculty restroom, turn to page 194. As much as I would like, oh, I'm sorry, Kevin, I forgot about you. <laughs> if you would, <clears throat> if you seek the solace and comfort of the Lord and go to the chapel, turn to page 81. <laughs> and we're gonna get married. Uh, wow. Um, DC7, I think, has a pretty decent chance of failure, and I'd like to see that happen in the chapel. Uh, so I'm going to start with that. As you walk into the chapel, you notice that all of the pews are occupied. All of the staff, all of the students, their heads bowed. Music swells as you walk down the aisle. You feel a dark presence behind you. You turn around. This shadow is stalking down the aisle. You hear the screams and wails of the congregation as it passes them. And then next to you, in front of the altar, is your new husband, Satan. Proud of Satan. Awesome. Glad that happened. Um, so let's have another morality tale in here and see what bad stuff happens when you take drugs. Uh, okay, so this just happened, right? Um, so this isn't your first time dropping acid, but this is your first time doing so after having what you're assuming are hallucinations. So you take the little tab and you put it on your tongue and you wait. And you feel as though maybe you should move around a little bit. So you start walking down the hall and you keep on walking. And eventually you find yourself in the swimming pool complex where you see Many, many people swimming laps, but you're not exactly sure that they're people. You can't see their heads because they never come up for breath. But there are many of them. And as they swim, the sounds of the splashing gets louder and louder. What do you do?
if you if you hide behind one of the carousel uh, statues holding up the uh, holding up the tile roof surrounding the classical Greco style pool and observe what happens next. Turn to page 28. If you if you feel the sudden desire to cool off with whatever this thing is, remove your clothes and dive in, turn to page 44. If you back away slowly from the pool and slip into the locker rooms, turn to page 100. If you just sit at the edge of the pool, dangling your feet into the water, and staring as the shapes move and coalesce and split apart what, for what seems like an eternity. Turn to page 71. I am going to pass because two of mine got taken. Uh, I was actually going to say the same thing. Uh, I, Chris definitely stole mine. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's go with the coalescing on page 71. All right. DC is eight. DC eight. And Okay. You slowly reach down and you pull your sh your slippers off. And you pull your socks off. You roll up your pajama pants as you sit down on the hard tile floor. And you dangle your feet into the water. And the camera zooms in as you splash your feet around a little bit. We hear you sigh, so you relax. And the sound of the splashing stops. And then with a sudden jerk of motion, you are dragged underwater. And as you're floating in this impossibly deep pool, you see it, that shadow standing there. Your heart swells. And you just have to walk into its embrace. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's go swimming. Oh, is that me taking off clothes? You are. Oh, boy, this LSD is really something and you feel the need to clear your head and cool off a little bit and so you 
want to join whoever's in there coming up towards you. You throw off your pajamas down to your small clothes, as they say in Game of Thrones. Promotional tie-in, right? And just like back on the farm, you do a cannonball right into the water, like you do in the creek back home. And Samantha is in there. Samantha was the one who was splashing towards you. Samantha says, oh, Claudia, I didn't know you liked to come swim at night. Samantha is looking very beautiful in the ambient moonlight coming in from the window. She dog paddles over to you. She puts her hands on your shoulders and leans forward and whispers in your ear, I have something I've wanted to show you for a very long time. What do you do? If you allow her to pull you under the water and return her embrace, turn to page 80. If you freak out and slap her across the face, turn to page 40. If you're offended by what sounds like a salacious offer and swim away to get out of the pool, turn to page 53. If you feel the bile rise in your throat as that diabolic dose of the devil's drugs makes its way out of your system and purifies you, turn to page 111. If you lose your shit because Samantha has been dead three years now, turn to page 12. That's a tough act to follow, Walter. <laughs> if you decide to reveal your true feelings to Samantha and say, Samantha, I'd love to see what you have to show me, but first, I'd like to kiss you. Turn to page 82. Uh, we're doing that one. All right. That's, that's the choice. Uh, DC's nine, so you're going to roll 2d6, and if you roll under nine, then you must narrate Becoming the Bride of Satan. Okay. Samantha smiles. Her smile is seductive and playful. And she laughs and swims away from you. Looking back as she back paddles toward the edge of the pool, you follow her. She gets out, and as she does, A circle forms around you of black cats. And the cats transform before your eyes into beautiful women wearing black bridesmaid dresses. You feel your body lifted from the water as you are levitated with a force out of your control and you find yourself floating 
towards Samantha as horns emerge from her forehead. A plus on that. All right, let's cheat. Uh, I'm going with Samantha. What? She's been dead. Go for it, Shane. Samantha was in a terrible car accident. And it was particularly traumatic for you, not just because she was one of your best friends, but because you almost got into that car as well. And there's a part of your brain that says, you're on acid, it's fine. You're on acid, it's fine. But that part isn't in control right now. And the only thing that you can think of doing is turning and climbing out of the pool, soaked to the bone, and running straight out into the courtyard towards that payphone. You get to the payphone, you're sh shuddering. You call your home collect. But no one picks up. What do you do? It's Walter. hang up the phone and run down the street in your small clothes, your hair and body still streaming with water, turn to page 42. If you accept help from the priest standing there in the street light, silhouetted turn to page 33 if the phone rings when you hang it up and you answer and listen turn to page 70. if you exit the phone booth reach down and pick up the axe that just happened to be sitting there. Turn to page 96. If you exit the phone booth and trip over the black cat that's in your way, turn to page 78. If you navigate the swirling, twirling labyrinth of colors that are interfering with your vision and make your way to the trash can on the corner to vomit your bad choices up. Turn to page 111. <laughs> and Samantha's in there. Careful with that axe, Claudia. DC's 10. All right. You, you stumble out of the phone booth, shaken, sad that your family doesn't love you anymore. You reach down. And you grip that handle tight. You pull the axe up to you as you shiver and walk back down the path towards the dorm. You creak the door back open. Your feet 
making wet thuds on the hardwood floor as you walk down the hall. Then far down the hall on the other end, you see a light coming out from under the door. But no one should be up this late. What do you do? This will be DC 11. Uh, Kevin. If you decide to complete your journey down the hallway, dragging the axe behind you, leaving a groove in the wood floor, and then burst through the door using the axe, screaming, Here's Johnny! Turn to page 18. I'm going to pass on this one. Sorry, what was that, Michael? I didn't. Oh, I, I said I think I'm going to pass on this one. Okay. I'm going to see what other people have to say. If you decide. to take the ax and with the assumption in your head this must all be a horrible dream and you decide to search out Miss Kinsley the history teacher who has given you an F on every test that you have taken while here. Turn to page 18. As <clears throat> if this moment suddenly reminds you of that time a few months ago when you took acid and you went chopping down trees with an axe only to realize later that you had hallucinated and you were actually just chopping vegetables in the kitchen Go and chop down some more trees. Turn to page 28. If you startle very easily and spin around and accidentally bury the ax in the head of whoever just stepped up behind you, roll, or roll, <laughs> turn to page 44. Um, if you lift the axe in front of you and catch the glimpse of a reflection of something behind you in the axe's blade, turn to one, page one point. Oh, that's the best one. Ah, oh, damn, these are all good. I'm going to go with reflection in the axe blade for the first choice dc's 11. yeah all right so lift the axe up and uh the hallway light reflecting on the axe you can just barely make out the silhouette of, of something behind you. 
and it's getting bigger. You're almost too afraid to turn around and look. As you slowly turn your head, the lights are, are dimming, and you see a, a dark figure reaching out to you with a hand. And the hallway behind you from where you came is now turned into a, a dark funeral procession, or wedding procession, sorry. Uh, but people are wearing black as if it were a funeral. And in, in some ways it is, as this figure takes your hand and leads you down the hallway. Excellent. Since, uh, since I'm cheating now, we're gonna go with uh, finding your history teacher. I wanna see where this goes. You make your way to the faculty wing. It's dark. There are some rooms that seem to have sound coming from them. But then you find the one room that is playing Vivaldi. Because Although there are no names on the doors, your history teacher is always playing Vivaldi. And so you look at the door and you kick your foot into the door and it slams open. And there is your history teacher. Doing sit-ups on the ground. In full 80s regalia. What do you do? <laughs> uh, if you raise the axe high over your head, run into the room toward your history teacher, shouting, Ah, I hate this. Turn to page 408. If you quite suddenly realize that you're just in the rec room of the orphanage you were raised in after your parents died, turn to page 91. We're going to pass on this one. If you break down sobbing and collapse to the floor, turn to page 113. If you decide to get down on the floor and also do sit-ups, turn to page 171. Just need some good old-fashioned exercise. That's all you ever needed. Um, if your instincts kick in, and all of your 
dancing training compels your feet to move along to the music and you dance. Turn to page 666. So just as a reminder, uh, this is DC 12. If, if your choice succeeds, um, then you must, uh, you must finish the story. So. Let's go with the breaking down crying. All right. As your knees hit the floor with a dull thud, your history teacher doesn't stop doing sit-ups. Your history teacher doesn't even know you're here. No one, no one cares that you're here, except for them. your only way out. You wipe the tears from your face and your eyes are still watery. You turn around and there's a hand sticking out, offering to pull you up off the floor and into your new life. And you take it. And the dark shadow envelops you. Right, this is the end. To the orphanage we go. Wait. What was I thinking? You say, this is just the, the gym and rec room of, of the orphanage you've lived at ever since your parents were killed in that thresher accident. How foolish to imagine that you were a gifted dancer, that you flew all the way to Italy because you're so special. How foolish to think that anyone would want to marry you. I guess it's almost time for lunch and you make your way down a dreary hall filled with kids of various ages, none of whom will ever be adopted into a forever family. You sit down, you begin eating your cold sandwich and you hate this place so much. Almost anything would be better than this. Why is this the hand you were dealt? You go about your day. You go back to the dormitory. You lay down on your bunk and you begin to drift off. But you don't quite fall asleep when you hear a car pulling up out front. You get up, you look out the window, and there is a black sedan. That's strange. Maybe someone from the state. The back doors open and a trio of women get out. Each wearing a long 
black dress and black veils over their faces as if they just got back from a funeral. The orphanage director goes out to speak to them as if it's the most normal thing in the world. Story's over. The end. <sighs> that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. We got two more to go, folks. I know. That, that was very good. That was super, super fun. That was the best Lombardi school. <laughs> that, was, that was a really good one. Uh, I, I called it wrong because I thought that that you were going to reveal that this girl had been Janice Griggs. I, I know. Time. Yeah, I know. No, no, I'm done. I know. They, they, no, the, the, the producers Pepper. did not know that people were going to love pork face. So they made right. this movie. Right. <laughs> um, all right. Awesome. Uh, let's take five. Let's be back uh, at three 30 or 30 after on the dot. Okay. Okay.
All right. Uh, Shane, are you still there? Or are you back? Or... Okay, right answer. That was really good. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> it was super moody and slow in a really great uh, way. And now yeah, for something was, completely different. Uh, yeah, I almost <laughs> thought of at the end of making, of having the orphanage director come back to her and say, uh, Janice, someone's here to see you, right? But I... I did not do that. I was determined them. for it to be a different movie. <laughs> I love how you, uh, Jason, I love how you bring these total, like, <laughs> just inversion of what's happening with your dream and the, the orphanage. And this this is awesome. Yeah, it's it's a fun game. It's see why Cheat Your Adventure is such a fun space to play in. Like, you can do. Um, you have a lot of room to like get really creative and I think that's why I like it so much. Yeah. yeah I thought, and you all did really well. Like it was just a good story. It was just a good, uh, good game. I really liked how you made me like value the marriage to Satan. Like I was like, Oh, I wish she got married to Satan. I know. I feel I bad. Like, she should have married Satan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Let's keep going. Dia de los Muertos for Return of Porkface from the oh. paper sorry. from the paper Netflix sleeve. A young boy gifted with psychic powers must explore his family's past and learn the truth of his connection to the legendary killer Porkface. Overview: Return of Porkface tells the story of a young boy, Michael, who has latent psychic abilities and who has managed to make contact with the spirit of the legendary killer Porkface. Throughout the course of the game, he will be tempted to commit violence by the spirit. He may also learn of his family's secret connection to the killer. On a failed role in this one, we must narrate how Michael and Porkface have become one, usually by showing Michael committing a terrible act of violence. So everybody got that? If you lose, Michael commits a terrible act of violence. Um, uh, so to be clear again, we're doing this as the cheat your own adventure again it's the same and yep. and and is it the last time the the sort of you was understood to be claudia and this time the you is understood to be michael it's the little boy michael yep okay uh so here's scene one your family just moved to the small coastal i'm gonna mute you walter your family has just moved to the small coastal town of santa juanita california while your dad is unloading boxes from the U-Haul truck and your mom is unwrapping dishes in the kitchen, you decide to go exploring. After carefully examining every room and closet in the two-story house, you decide to next go into the basement. The basement is dark and piled high with junk, old paint supplies, moldering furniture, and, and hey, an old popcorn machine like in the circus, so that's pretty cool. You see a trunk too, and then you hear something like a voice, a soft whisper. You've heard whispers like it before. Unseen things are always whispering to you. You've learned to ignore it, but where is this whispering coming from? Is it coming from the trunk? You slowly, carefully undo the dingy brass latches and raise the lid. You're startled to see the head of a pig staring back at you from the bottom of the trunk. But no, not an actual pig a mask, a rubber pig mask. What do you do? If you reach out to the pig, both physically and psychically, and, and see what it shows you, turn to page 100. If you playfully grab the mask, sneak back upstairs while putting it on, and surprise your mother as she's putting away dishes. Turn to page nine. If you take the mask out of the trunk and take it upstairs and give it to your little sister 
turn to page 63. If you ask your imaginary friend Patches what you should do, turn to page 17. If you decide to take out the rest of the <clears throat> of the pig costume and put it all on and go upstairs and act like a pig running around the kitchen, turn to page 83. If you decide you're hungry and you'd love some of that delicious popcorn, go and start a batch in that crazy old fashioned popcorn maker by turning to page 402. I'm going to go with um, Scaring Mom, whoever that was. Okay. You creak back up the dusty stairs from the basement. And the mask is a little too big for you, but you keep it on with one hand. Your mom's preoccupied putting away plates. Um, so you're easily able to sneak up behind her. And you poke her in the back as you go. <laughs> She turns around, completely startled, sees the masks, drops the plates that she had in her hands with a loud crash as they shatter. She like, gasps a bit and then yanks the mask off your head. And it's like, Michael, where did you find that? <laughs> Don't ever do that again. And you look a little forlorn. But what do you do? Kevin. If you decide to take the mask and go play up in the attic, which you haven't explored yet, turn to page 14. When your mother starts laughing in amusement at your pig face and you shriek at her in anger, turn to page 17. If you take your pig mask up to your new bedroom and decide to put it under your pillow. Turn to page 33. If you decide now would be a good time to meet some of the local kids at the playground down the street and show them the pig mask. Turn to page 26. If you see the neighbor kid playing in the backyard and decide to go say hi, turn to page 13. A couple people took mine. I'll go with, if you decide to put on the mask and go see who else you can scare, turn to page 80. I'll go with, uh, your mom starts laughing and you get angry.
Is this DC three now or two, two now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Your mom's laughing at you and saying, <laughs> that mask is rather ridiculous. And something inside you boils up. And the voice that comes out of you is surprisingly deep. Stop laughing at me. Your mother says, oh, well, sounds like someone might be going through some changes in his young life. I'll have to be having a discussion with your father about that. Now, be a dear and go put away the rest of your of your clothes and, and put all your toys away, you know. We're, I know we're, we moved into a new house, but there's no reason we have to be living around all these cardboard boxes for too long. She shoes you out of the kitchen. What do you do? If you then hear the dulcet tones of the ice cream truck coming down the drive, check your pocket to see that you do still have that 75 cents you earned last week and run out to the ice cream truck with the mask on, turn to page 77. If you decide that now would be a good time to try and scare dad with the mask, turn to page 92. If you casually pick up the chef's knife that your mom just unpacked without her noticing, turn to page 14. If you broodingly storm away from your mom and go see what else you can find in the box. Turn to page 94. I'm gonna pass. If you decide to go out to the garage and get the hammer out of your father's toolbox so you can drive some nails into the wall in your bedroom so you can hang up your posters. Turn to page 71. Let's start with ice cream truck. DC3. So you run out, and thankfully the, uh, the ice cream truck driver notices you running out, <clears throat> and he comes and he stops at the side of the road, and he hops into the back, and he opens up the window, and he looks down at you and says, what do you have, son? And then he does a double take because you're still wearing the pig's mask, and he says, now, what what exactly are you wearing there, boy? I mean, it's not even Halloween. And you take off the mask, though strangely, it takes a little bit of effort to do so. It feels like it's caught up on your head a little bit. But you're able to get it off, and you laugh at yourself, and you hand him 75 cents, and you say, strawberry, please. And he gives you a soft serve ice cream of strawberry. And you start, you turn around, and you start licking the soft serve ice cream 
out of the cone, a little bit dribbling over your fingers because you forgot to get a napkin. Your mom always tells you to get the napkin, but you never remember. And you tilt your head and notice that that tree, the big tree in the yard, seems to have some sort of rope dangling from it. What do you do? If you decide to go over and climb the rope and see how high the tree you can go, turn to page 99. If the rope is attached to a swing and you go ask the little boy who's on it if he wants to be your friend, turn to page six. If the rope is a ladder up to a tree house that looks dilapidated and long abandoned, turn to page 200. If you notice strange old fraying throughout the rope, turn to page 214. If you decide that that rope has a tire swing on it, you climb onto that tire swing. And you ask the man in the denim jacket standing there to push you. Turn to page 105. If you blink your eyes hard a few times and realize that you're still in the basement, you're staring at the pull string for the light bulb, realize that you're no longer licking an ice cream cone. Turn to page 28. Denim jacket. DC4. So DC4. The man seems nice enough. Doesn't talk to you, though just pushes you steadily on the swing back and forth. The day's getting warmer. Ice cream's dribbling down your arm. You're getting bored with this. You hop off the swing, turn around, and look up into the face of the man. You see, he also has a pig mask on. What do you do? Well, <laughs> hmm. wow, bring it around <laughs> in a moment. <laughs> if you realize you aren't eating an ice cream. You're eating one of your dad's brownies that he always tells you not to eat. Turn to page 56. If you laugh and say, oh, come on, dad, that's not funny. Turn to page 29. If you... No, it's me. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. yeah, yeah. If it's not a man at all, but a woman, turn to page 19.
if you feel a strange connection with this figure, turn to page 93. If you instinctually walk to them and give them a big hug, turn to page nine. I'll just throw in one here. If you run away screaming, <laughs> turn to page two. <laughs> They're all so flipping good. I'm going to go with holy pork face. It's actually a woman. Wait, it's not a man at all. You only thought it was a man because of how ripped this person is. But it's a woman. You don't have any other reason to think it's a woman, but you know it's a woman. She kneels down. She stretches out her hand, the fingernails caked with dried blood. And she strokes your soft cheek. And she takes the pig mask from your hand, you having removed it momentarily, and slips it back over your head. She says nothing, but she stands up and she points to the house next door. and then disappears. What do you do? If you walk across the street and peer through the living room window of the house next door, catching a glimpse of the family there, turn to page 90. If you first grab the thick, heavy, fallen tree branch, turn to page 96. If you go across the street, Decide you're going to look in the backyard and see if they have a swing set or sandbox or maybe a doghouse back there. Turn to page 85. If you comply utterly and without hesitation and walk right up to the door, and reach for the handle. Turn to page 98. If with dread in your heart, but certainty in your soul, walk through the thickly overgrown weeds Boost yourself up onto a broken box and look through the broken piece of glass in the building next door. Turn to page 85. If Upon adjusting the pig's mask so that it fits you, 
comfortably and snugly. You are now able to clearly see a pair of rusty garden shears where the vanished woman previously stood and pick them up and stride to the neighbor's house. Turn to page 101. Fuck yes, that one. <laughs> DC six. Okay, let's see. All right. <clears throat> the garden shears feel very comfortable in your hand. The worn leather handle feels soothing and you massage it in your fingers to comfort you because you're otherwise feeling a little perturbed from the long day of moving your mother being scared and then laughing and then dismissive of you and as you're thinking this and you find yourself now at the neighbor's doorstep What do you do? If you ring the doorbell, turn to page 39. If you decide to slip your small body through the, the doggy door into the house, turn to page 110. If you jam those rusty shears into the door jam and crank the door open with a violent yank of your hands, Turn to page 54. If you decide to walk halfway back up the sidewalk <clears throat> from the stoop and hold the shears above your head and scream bloody murder, turn to page 14. If you stand before the threshold and reach out with your mind to lift the door and wrench it from its hinges with your telekinetic abilities, turn to page 48. If just as you are about to put the point of the shears to the door to scrape something into the wood, the door opens from the inside. Turn to page 50. Good choices. Yeah, a lot of good choices. I'm going to turn to the page where I crawl through the pet door. DC seven. So <clears throat> you have to kind of scrunch yourself up and, and slide through the pet door ever so carefully, try not to make too much noise so as to startle the family inside. And with the garden shears in your hands, you slowly start walking through the living room and you can hear them laughing having such a good time not not so much like your family and you you feel a twinge of jealousy what do you do
if if you just want to give them a really big scare, turn to page eighty-eight. If you decide to go down the hallway, go into the parents' bedroom and hide in the master closet, turn to page 93. That's a classic pork face move, by the way. Just throwing that out there. If you follow the sound of light jazz coming from the living room. <laughs> Turn to page 73. If you notice that for some odd reason, there's a lengthy extension cord wrapping out and around from the room that you're hearing the sound to the room that you are in, and you decide to clip the cord with the garden shears, turn to page 30. If you decide to go into the kitchen, and take the container of Crisco out of the closet. Turn to page 402. I really want to know what's going on there. If you hear Vivaldi coming from the home gym and you want to go investigate what that's all about, turn to page 45. I'm going to turn to page 30 and clip the extension cord. So, <clears throat> Jewel, DC8. So, you clip the cord. And you hear the laughing die off. And you hear a man's voice shout, what the fuck? And then you hear a woman say, George, not around this children. And you hear pounding on the television. And then you hear stomping coming around. And there in front of you is a man you've never seen before. But you know that look in his eyes. You've seen that look before. And normally, you would run and hide because you didn't want to get hurt. But this time, this time something else happens. And you run up and drive the end of the shears into his groin. And the blood trickles down onto your hands with a glorious warmth. All right. That was awesome. All right. Um, I think I'm going to go hide in the closet in the parents' bedroom. Uh, 
After crouching down and hiding in this large, spacious walk-in closet, you must, must have dozed off. It was so warm and stuffy in there. You wake up and you hear strange moaning and grunting sounds from outside of the closet. What do you do? Uh, who is it? Hmm. If you turn to the boom box sitting in the closet next to you, the tape deck, that is, and press play, turn to page 99. If you <clears throat> turn and open the hatchway in the back of the closet and investigate where it goes, turn to page eight. If you quietly Crack open the closet door and peer out into the bedroom. Turn to page 72. If you reach down, no, sorry. If you ask the other little boy hiding in the closet, if they want to be your friend, turn to page 19. Sorry, turn to page six. You use the garden shears to ever so slowly and quietly reach out of the closet and flip off the light switch. Turn to page 60. If you carefully use the shears to cut out little pig shapes from all of the clothes nearby hanging in the closet, turn to page 70. Oh my God, as much as I want to see Mr. and Mrs. George's faces when they put on their clothes, I got to make a new friend in the closet. A DC's nine, right? You saw the little boy, Healy, and you Carefully consider them. The little boy says, who are you? You say, my name's Michael. I just moved in next door. Do you want to be my friend? Okay, sure. And you spend the next 18 to 25 minutes watching the little boy's parents in flagrante delicto from inside the closet. And when it's all over, you say, Wow, that was really fun. Yeah, it was. 
The little boy says, do you want to come see my room? Yeah, let's. And when the coast is clear, you sneak off to his room, making little oinking sounds the whole way. Roughly 30 minutes later, the little boy's mother is calling for him to come down for dinner. Tommy, Tommy, I made you some Totino's pizza rolls. When there's no response, she marches up the stairs. Tommy, don't make me don't make me say another time to come down. You know I hate when you don't listen to me. You know I hate it when you don't do what I say. And I really hate it when you hide in the closet. She continues listing things that she hates that Tommy does. And when she opens the door, her face goes white and she screams. Your story has ended. <laughs> Up to the very end, I was like, is he gonna say, what do you do? <laughs> oh man. Okay, so. I think we're going to cut special little fun shapes of pig's heads out of all of their clothes <laughs> using those squeaky, rusty shears. Oh, all right. You, you try your hardest to quietly cut shapes in the clothes. You try to time it during the particularly noisy bits outside. But the shears are rusty and old. They make some loud, sharp, rust on rust noises. And you hear the sounds outside stop. And you hear some quiet mumbling. Like, what? What was that? Is there something, like, something going on? But you keep going. You keep going until you hear footsteps right outside the closet door. What do you do? If you decide to make a break for it, when the closet door swings open, counting on them being startled and taken aback, turn to page 14. If you hide in a thick fur coat and try to see what their reaction to your tailoring is, turn to page 44. If in your urgency, in your panic, you discover the small child size compartment under the carpet in the closet and quickly hide yourself there, turn to page 49. If you become disturbed by the whispered taunts that occasionally have haunted you for years, 
taunts of other children teasing you and you decide to snort like a pig in rage back at them. Turn to page three. If you curl into a ball and start crying and make up a story that you're lost, turn to page four. If you close your eyes and concentrate on the bookshelf across the room and try to topple it to create a distraction, Turn to page 50. Oh, man. I'm going to... Let's go with the... Oinking. Walters. Just become a pig. <laughs> DC ten. <coughs> DC ten. As you oink and begin running around, feeling very primal and animalistic, the door suddenly whips open and you see in front of you this woman dressed in leotards, sweat on her brow with exercise straps attached to the opposite wall where she had been working out. And she looks at you and says, what, are, are you okay? You, oh, you, you, you poor little boy, you seem so just, you just, are, are you okay? And she, she kneels down to comfort you. And you look through the pig mask, oinking, hearing the taunting voices, and everything is red. And this woman is red. And she looks so concerned. And then the look turns to fear as you raise the rusty garden shears over your head. Then you scream like a pig once more. What do you do next? <laughs> I got a 12. I love it. <laughs> I, I, good. Um, none of us were prepared for anything now. Um, of course, I have to go first. Okay. It, if, if you say, oh, I'm sorry, mom, I'm just joking. Turn to page nine. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, so you're cutting out a little bit. I missed what you said. Okay, um, I just said, um, uh, basically, I'm, just, I'm pretending to be Tommy. So yeah. if you say sorry, mom, just kidding. Can you guys hear me okay now? Or okay. I can hear you, yeah. If you look past your mom and see the woman in the denim jacket, Turn to page 10. Oh, dang. Oh. Page 
If you let her lead you downstairs to the kitchen. To get something to eat. Turn to page 31. Just to interject real quick, to be perfectly clear, this is not our mom. This is the neighbor's, the neighbor woman. So just, yeah. I probably made it confusing because I was pretending to be Tommy in my choice. If you decide to shove Tommy into her and run out of the room, turn to page 133. This one might be towing the line tone-wise, or uh, subject matter-wise. <laughs> um, if you hesitate when you see the lustful gleam in her eye, turn to page 69. If uh, uh, if you shove down your hand and it is caught by the woman in the denim jacket, turn to page twenty four. Uh, that's nice. All right. Uh, turn to page 24. I, my hand is caught by the woman in the denim jacket. 11. Oh, boy. You throw down your hand, and it's caught by the woman in the denim jacket. And everything stops. And you turn and look to the woman who is now wearing a pig face as well. And she says, <clears throat> No, here, and gently moves your hand to a slightly different position and lets go. And time starts back again, and you jam it into the woman's jugular vein, and blood spurts out and covers the eyes of your mask and you start to snort. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, after that, I think I need a break. I think it's time to cheat and uh, let the woman lead me down to the kitchen for a snack. <laughs> right. Your hand just drops to the side, still loosely holding on to the shears. You, you can't let go. The other hand, the woman grabs, leads you downstairs to the kitchen. She tells you to take a seat at the table true kindness in her voice. She rummages in the freezer and you see her get a plate. Uh, you, you, you smell that. You, you know the smell. 
pizza rolls. And they come out, and you just start scarfing them down. You don't bother taking off the mask, you just stuff them under. You can't stop. Um, uh, and you're just cover you're just like making a mess. She looks a little concerned. She's like, here, let me help you get cleaned up. And you look down and the plate is completely empty. You've demolished the Totino's pizza rolls. And she's coming at you with a towel. What do you do? If you vomit up the Totino's pizza rolls that you ate too quickly on her, turn to page two. The director keeps trying to insert this puke thing into the movies, and we're not having it. Um, if you... Accept the towel and crack open a window to let the cool evening breeze in to help cool you down. Turn to page 84. If you scream out in a deep bellowing voice. Ice cream! Turn to page. Walter. Is that it? Okay. Uh, if you warn the kind woman offering you the towel that there is another woman with a pig mask approaching behind her. Turn to page 38. If you accept this woman as your new mommy, turn to page nine. If there's a yell from upstairs from Tommy, Mom, where are my Tortino's pizza rolls? And she looks at you with horror and confusion, realizing for the first time that you're not Tommy. Turn to page 10. First pick is going to be accepting her as your new mom. Good. DC 12, if I get boxcars, this will end it. Lock up. She slips the mask off your face, wipes your mouth and sits down and says, I'm so glad you finally made it here. Tommy, come down and meet your new little brother. All right, mom. Tommy comes down, holding the bleeding carcass of a cat. Look what I found, he says. Tommy, oh, now I have to clean up all this mess. Just wait till your father gets home. She gets up, goes into the closet to grab a mop, and you see 
two or three bodies hanging from chains inside of the closet. <sighs> always, always, always something. Hmm. And your new mommy sits down, puts her hands on your knees and says, well, I fear your old parents are going to miss you. We should probably make sure they don't come looking for you. And you nod your head. She slips the pig mask back over your head, presses a chef's knife into your hand and says, you get going then and gives you a little pat on the bottom to send you on your way. Fiend. That was a fail, by the way. <laughs> the, the violence is going to happen. All right. Then the alternate, alternate ending. Let's go with you hear Tommy yell down for his mom from upstairs. Like he just has Tatino's pizza rolls and only yeah. cares about mom. <laughs> well, yeah. She's a pizza roll vehicle. She's a vehicle for a pizza, a pizza roll delivery vehicle. Yeah. Uh, this, she... is, this is the end of the story, by the way. This is the end. So, so Tommy's mom lets out a shriek as she realizes that under that pig face mask is not Tommy, as she had thought. And now she's got some boy in her room with a pair of garden shears. And she backs away from you as you wipe some Tortino's grease from your pig mouth face. And you just uh, get up from the table and tell her that You'll be back for some more Tortina's pizza rolls. <laughs> and you slowly walk from the room, dragging your garden shears on the ground and let yourself out of the house. And you look around the neighborhood, realizing that there's so many more opportunities to scare people. Nice. <laughs> All right, so that was great. We have, uh, we've got one more, uh, but we're running over on time and we're definitely gonna push up against the scheduled time. Um, so I will give everybody the option. Um, we'll, take a, we'll take a five minute break. If you can stay a little longer to finish the third story, uh, please do. Uh, but if you can't, that's totally fine too. Um, we will, uh, we, I, I recommend probably just calling it a night if you can't stay, stay to finish the third one. So yeah, does anybody have any thoughts about that before we go? Yeah, I'm gonna have to pass on the third one, unfortunately. Yeah, no worries, no worries. <clears throat> but that was a ton of fun. Yeah, it was really, really went really dark fun. early and then it went crazy and then it... <laughs> <laughs> uh I'll figure it out after the break. Okay, cool. All right, well let's just take five. So. All right. Okay, see you. <laughs>
we really need to put together a collection of these things. All one of the right. things that, one of the really yeah, delightful yeah. surprises for me is uh, this, how well this cheat your own adventure works with horror because there's this suspense of, is the mm. story going to stop now or is it going to continue? Uh, yeah, it's, 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 really, it I hadn't good. expected that to interact so well. It's a great little system, if I'm being honest. I mean, it it can do, we one time did like a trio of like pulp, like stories in the Pulp Fiction universe. And they were like, so good. Yeah. It was, it was like Pulp Fiction and like that, like the narratives were kind of like twisty and interwoven, you know, but and it was really good. Like it, it worked out like really great. And um, I've done like really sad cheat your own adventures, like about like dying people, you know, and trying I to really like, want to see that one. In orders. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was probably, I mean, like that was one of the early CYAs I played and it was like, I mean, everybody was crying. Like it was so sad. Like just the the fail was you died like bitter and alone. <laughs> it's really like grim, but uh, it was very satisfying. I will note, uh, you really do need to have like a tone conversation in the beginning because it's very easy for this to go gone so fast. Uh, it, it is. Yeah. 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 It's, um, yeah. Well, we're going to the surreal one next. So here we go. Dia de los Muertos 5, Noche de Terror. From the film school dissertation trying to convince you this movie is a classic. A screenwriter has been asked to deliver a script for a new entry in the legendary Dia de los Muertos horror franchise but can he keep himself together as the line between fantasy and reality begin to blur? Here's the overview. Noche de Terror tells the story of a Hollywood screenwriter, James, who has been asked, who has been tasked with the job of writing the script for Dia de los Muertos 6. He begins to realize that the world of his script is starting to invade the real world and that the fictional character Porkface may be trying to kill him. The failed role, you must narrate the first appearance of Porkface in the real world and then show how she kills James. Okay. So we're going meta. We're going meta and we're going surreal. Scene one. <clears throat> you promised us this script weeks ago, your producer yells on the other line. How hard can it be? Hot Chick goes into woods with boyfriend. Hot Chick bangs his brains out. Hot Chick is murdered by killer in pig mask. It's just not that difficult. You hang up the phone. He'll get his script when you're damn well ready. You turn back to the scene you were working on, the apartment scene. Sure, the apartment looks just like yours. Same carpet, same leather couch, same poster of John Lennon on the wall. But the audience doesn't need to know that, right? Scene. Allison gets up from the leather sofa to make herself a drink. As she is placing ice in a tumbler, she hears a noise coming from the closet. Wait a second. Did you just hear a noise coming from the closet? No way. What are the chances that the precise moment you are reading about your main character hearing a noise in the closet, you hear a noise coming from your own closet? But there it is again. Some kind of thumping noise. What do you do? If you turn back to the story you've written and continue to read, turn to page 10. If you quietly step over to the closet and put your ear to the door, just to double check, turn to page five. If you put on some headphones to drown out any distracting noises, turn to page eight.
if you decide that it's actually just your roommate and his boyfriend doing that thing again, and you decide to take your laptop and go to the coffee shop, turn to page 45. If you throw up your hands and sigh and realize that this city apartment is just too noisy for you to focus right now under all this stress, take up your friend Brett's offer to relax and focus at his quiet cabin in the woods by the lake and pack your bags. Turn to page 22. If you call out, Tommy, are you hiding in the closet again? Turn to page three. Why did I give an option? I was the reader. <laughs> it felt right then. Um, I'm going with the cabin. I'm going with the cabin one. That's the, the only answer. So uh, DC one, which doesn't matter. So <laughs> okay, all right. I'll, uh, I won't even bother to roll then. Let's see. So you pack your bags and uh, you jump in a rental car and head off to the cabin and. As you get closer, you realize what a great, great idea this was. You can, as you, as you turn off the engine out in front of the cabin at the end of the long, windy dirt road, you hear the birds chirping and the wind rustling peacefully through the trees. And as the sun is setting, you see the, the light across the lake and already you just feel the stress melting away. You can tell that you're gonna be so productive. You're gonna get so much done. So you grab your bag and you head toward the cabin. But as you reach the door, you're suddenly taken aback to realize that the door is wide open. What do you do? If you realize you saw, sorry, if you remember that you saw Deputy Griggs's SUV parked a little ways up the road, Turn to page six. You think a wind, maybe the wind or, or some animal must have knocked the door ajar and so you just walk up the steps and let yourself in, turn to page 20. If, in a fit of inspiration, you go inside, immediately sit down at your laptop and type. Allison sits down in the cabin, having escaped the city noises, <laughs> dot, 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 turn to page. 61. Hmm. If you decide to circle around the home and look through the windows, investigate this door further, turn to page 11. If you decide <clears throat> uh, 
to follow a small black pig that just <laughs> ran past your legs as you were standing in front of the house around the side of the building. Turn to page 55. Oh, that's challenging. But <laughs> I'm going to turn to the page with Deputy Griggs. You remember seeing Deputy Griggs's police SUV just a ways up the road. Uh, maybe, maybe he parked and yeah, maybe he's inside. Maybe he's just, it's a routine thing. Maybe you heard something, I don't know. You move, you walk in, you say, Deputy Griggs, are you in there? There's no response. You step through the threshold of the door and you close the door behind you. Everything is as you left it. Your desk is calling you. You set down your computer, unpack your bag, unaware that the door is opening behind you. But you feel it. The hair is standing up on the back of your neck. And then the squeak. You always knew you needed to put some WD-40 on that door. Because it's a good thing you didn't. Someone's behind you. What do you do? DC's three. Well, once I pick. But. Uh, if you turn and see Deputy Griggs standing there, a uh, concerned look on his face. Turn to page 12. If all you can see is all of the curtains in the room waving in the breeze as if someone had just walked by them. Turn to page 17. If you breathe in deeply through your nose and smell a strong smell of iron wafting in through the door. Turn to page 23. If you slam down the top of your laptop and exclaim, how can I be writing this trite bullshit? And storm out of the cafe Turn to page 43. If you're concerned about the squeaking door behind you is suddenly magnified by the realization that the stuffed boar's head over the fireplace is missing, turn to page 52. Shane, you're up. DC3. You really need to just like figure something else out because this is just not working. So you pay your tab very quickly walk out of the cafe, you jump in your car, 
and you're like, fuck it, I'm just driving. And you start driving, and the light starts to fade, it becomes night, and suddenly you look and notice that you are in the desert. And you swear that as you drove along, you saw a circle of people in black robes out in the desert. What do you do? I hate you, Shane. <laughs> I want to know more about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. If you pull up besides the circle of people in black and realize that joining your regular LARP group for their special uh, for their special event that they're having out here is the right thing to do. Turn to page twenty-two. Page twenty-two. If you continue driving because you've written enough horror movies to know that you're fucking crazy if you stop and go back over there in the middle of the fucking night in the desert, a bunch of people worshiping the devil next, turn to page 14. <laughs> if as your attention is momentarily on these gathering in the in the desert and you lose sight of the road and you look back and there's some kind of large pig in the road that you swerve to miss and you uh wreck your car on the side of the road in the desert turn to page 20. if you just if you're just so shook by this that you you floor the accelerator and you drive your car straight through the group of road figures. Turn to page 64. If you turn on the radio to try to shake the image of those people out of your head, Keep on driving. Turn to page 26. Hmm. Let's keep on driving. Right, four. Um, no, fuck no. Three times over, fuck no. No. I wrote, I've written enough, you, you have written enough horror movies to know that whenever you're out at night, and you see something weird going on on the road, off the side of the road, and you stop, you're just asking for it. I mean, you are just asking for it. <sighs> I mean, 
hello, you wrote Bride of Satan 3. And that's exactly how it ended. You keep driving. Uh, just feels like you've been driving for a really long time. California desert. Long open stretch of road. You gotta be hitting the blue hairs and Palm Springs by now, but you haven't. It's all starting to blur together a little bit. It feels like a, like a David Lynch movie almost. Yes, there, roadside motel. Yes, 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 I'm going for the full Truman Capote experience, you say, as you take the exit. Pull up. Truman Capote did his best work out of hotel rooms and motel rooms. You get out. You go to the front. You ring the bell. No one answers. Is that oinking you hear coming from the office? That's definitely a pig's oinking. What do you do? If you ring the bell at the front desk hard and, and call out, is there anyone here? I want a room. But all you hear is winking. Turn to page 20. If you reach behind the counter and grab the first pair of keys that you reach and turn to just take yourself a room, turn to page 52. If you uh, walk up closer to the sound to see if you can discern its source, turn to page 63. If you lean your head over just enough to peek at the room behind the front desk where the oinking is coming from. And you see a computer with a glitchy screen with a pig on it, but are then more disturbed by the room being full of avian taxidermy. Turn to page 10. If upon hearing the pig noises and looking around you, you say to yourself, oh, I got it. That's the plot twist I need. And you take out your notebook and begin scrambling down notes. Turn to page 48. I want that one, 48, DC5. All right. Damn, your pencil lead breaks. You look around for a pen. There must be one somewhere. You go behind the front desk to look for a pen in the oinking of 
the pigs seem louder. There's, there's more than one pig sound. You can't tell how many. Are they coming from the room through the wall? Must be a pig farmer. No, there's no pig farms out here, are there? You decide to go outside and as you approach the room where the pig noises are coming from, what do you do? If you realize this is the exact plot of Motel Hell 3, turn to page 41. If you grab a pen and, and start taking notes as you proceed, knowing that this is great material, turn to page 30. If you just can't stand it, and you turn around and walk back out the door, turn to page 13. If you just can't stand it and need to know further, reach for the door handle, open the door just slightly and turn to page 111. If as you stand outside, you hear a door slam shut somewhat far away, and you look up and notice someone walking down from a house on a hill, down towards you, and you decide to wait for them, turn to page 86. I'll turn to page 111 and open the door. This is a DC seven? DC six. Oh. That was Brian's, right? Is it Brian's or? Michael, I think. Was that, oh, uh, oh where two people have to open the door? Yeah, because Brian, Brian was taking notes. Oh, taking notes. Michael had a creek door open. Yeah. It's like taking notes while you go in or peeking in. Yeah. Oh, you I'm sorry. I, I didn't know that you were opening the door. Sorry about that. Uh, open the door. <laughs> it's fine. I guess which one do you want to go with? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll go with, uh, <laughs> excuse me. I'll go with Michael. Okay. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> I, I was just like, oh, I want to open the door. Anyway. Um, so you, you go to reach for the door handle and you, you wipe your hands on your, on your pants. Um, cause you feel, uh, well, uh, starting with the, the beginning and then yeah, you okay. do a roll, um, wipe the sweat off your palms. Um, and then you go to reach for that door handle and, um, you start to creak it open and you turn it just slightly and the sound gets louder. It's definitely oinking and multiple pigs and just barely cracking that door open, you're overcome by this like huge wafting scent of pig shit. And it's like, you, you almost like gag because of the smell. And you open the door and there are rows and rows of pigs in cages. 
there's light, dim fluorescent like bars of light up here. Um, it almost looks like from outside what the whole hotel's size would have been, right? It goes on that far. Um, and you just overcome by this cacophony of smell and sound um, and you're confused by this distortion of time and space, right? That there's no way it could be this big on the inside. Um, what do you do? If you nope the fuck out and get in your car and you're like, I have seen this one. Nope. And you pull out onto the highway and continue driving. Turn to page 61. If you decide this is gold, your friends at the Animal Liberation Front, I'll eat this up, and you take out your cell phone to start filming it. Turn to page 18. If you are surprised to see the heroine of your story, Allison, approaching you, turn to page 31. This reminds you of a story that you once wrote, and you know that in that story, there was a girl walks up in the other side of the room. You decide to go see what's, what's over there. Turn to page 90. If you give in to the seemingly endless interior space and walk forward to a deep, dark staircase, turn to page 92, footnote three. Well, I'm very curious about that footnote, but uh, I think I'm more curious about Allison. Footnote seven. You have had way too much time on the road tonight. That woman who's approaching you from this stockyard? That yellow dress, those red shoes, the little blue clutch. That's Allison. What? That isn't, oh my God. She's getting closer. She smiles and says, this is where a very, very talented screenwriter would reveal that the protagonist is actually Porkface. And she would put her hands in her little blue clutch and pull out a knife and slice open your throat. Are you a very good screenwriter? Would you have thought of such a plot twist, James? She opens up her blue clutch, reaches in, and pulls out a compact. 
No, you're not, she says as she fixes her makeup. You need to run, James. She's almost here. She's almost here. I managed to get away, but I don't think you're going to be so lucky. And you find yourself back on the road. <sighs> that long, long road. Jesus Christ, you need to stop. You really need to stop. How much longer can you go? What do you do? You pull over the side of the road down a long dirt road that leads to a cabin that seems a lot like the one you'd written out before. Turn to page 10. If you just pull off the side of the road, set your seat back as far as it can go and try to get a little bit of sleep, turn to page 19. Yeah, I'm worried about Brian. <laughs> Is he coming back? Um, If you start to feel your eyes, your eyelids getting heavy and drooping, you decide you need to turn on the radio to try to keep yourself awake. Turn to page 108. If you pull over to the side of the road to comply with the police officer in the car behind you, whose lights are going, even though you don't think you've been speeding, turn to page 86. Sorry, my mic. If you roll down the window a bit so you get a little fresh air, and then look beside you at your girlfriend, Allison, asleep in the passenger seat, and you tell her, darling, we're almost there. Turn to page eight. I think there is a fair chance. I want to see that one, but I'm, a, I'm pretty sure there's a fair chance that the first roll is going to miss. And so I'm going to go with Brian's instead. Uh, Brian, uh, the cabin. <laughs> What's the DC? Or eight. eight. <clears throat> so you turn down this road thinking maybe you'll just pull over somewhere and close your eyes for a little bit. So you're going down the dirt road looking for a good spot to pull over. But it dead ends at this cabin in the woods. And you immediately recognize that this the one that you had in your mind when you were describing cabin in your story it uh, strikes you as odd you decide to get out of your car and as you approach the cabin you notice the door ajar just like your story and I think this this can't be coincidence I, am I hallucinating? Am I that tired? 
you decide to walk up into the cabin and let yourself in. It's, it's exactly as you had described it. You just slowly make your way from room to room, becoming increasingly horrified. And you find yourself at the desk, looking down at the computer that you didn't put there, but it's got your story written in it. And at that moment, you hear a creak from behind you. It's the door creaking. What do you do? Ah. Oh, man. If you, you turn And close and lock the door. Turn to page 113. If you scroll through the story that you had written and see what happens next, turn to page 29. If you turn and look towards the door and see a tired, exhausted you walking through the door, turn to page 22. If you decide the creaking of this old house is something to get to later, but right now it's more important that you return Deputy Griggs' call from earlier this afternoon. Turn to page eight. If you turn to see Allison, the woman who is writing Dia de los Muertos Six, Turn to page seven. It's turn to see Allison. DC's nine. Ugh. Okay. Uh, give me a minute. You turn and you see Allison again. That seems wrong. That's not how this is supposed to go at all. Allison steps forward and says, oh, imagine if you came into the cabin and realized that the character you've been writing this whole time was actually the author and you're the character. She holds up her blue clutch opens it and says, that would be some plot twist. 
She reaches her hand in, lets out a loud, terrible squeal, and whips out a knife and slashes your throat. Pork face! Pork face! <laughs> All right, let's go with scrolling through the story. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you, Shane, because you sound like you have a pretty good idea. So if you had some of the mind, I want you to take it. All right. Um, so you scroll down, and you see that it says, that the author looks back at the squeaking door and sees himself coming in. And then it just trails off. There isn't any more typing. And you turn and look And you come in through the door and see the laptop where you left it. And you think, I have an idea. And you sit down at the, t at the desk, you start typing. And suddenly, wafting in, in the night air, is a perfume that you haven't smelled. No, it couldn't be. And you turn your head and look through the window and you see the top of someone's red head walk past. What do you do? As in like red hair? <clears throat> top. Ah. <laughs> uh. If you decide to pick up the blue clutch, you notice laying on the table beside you, turn to page 23. If you decide to pick up the blue clutch, pull out the compact and fix your makeup, Turn to page 19. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> if you lean into the computer and watch as new letters are slowly typed into the story, turn to page 73. If you reach over, and from the blue clutch, pull a knife, turn to page 172. If you decide that this is all way too meta for the common viewing audience, there's no way that the producers are going to go for this. And you slam down your laptop lid and startle your fellow cafe visitors. Turn to page six. Uh, 
Back up. <laughs> I'm gonna go with cafe. Let's hope I fail because makeup sounds cool. Uh, decent. Time. Well, so. <laughs> He slammed down the laptop lid. Um, you start putting it away in your bag, slam down what's left of your latte, right? Um, you, you have a feeling you should just head over to, there's a local theater that plays crappy horror movies. You're just like, I just need to go and watch like whatever's whatever's on tonight, you know, just, just to see... Um, Really entrench myself in the genre and remember what it was that people really worked with, right? Um, so you kind of sling your bag over your shoulder, and uh, you you walk out, and the the doors the the bells on the door swing behind or kind of clang behind you. Um, but in your rush, you didn't really notice that everyone was staring at you silently. Everyone your whole trip out. And even as you walk away, the camera stays as you walk off and shows people walking up to the window and staring at you. Um, you come up to the marquee um, and wouldn't you know it, uh, Dia de los Muertos 7 is showing. You know, and you didn't even you, you didn't even know where that was, right? Where where did that that was supposed to be some lost footage or something that, that never got into production? Uh, so you pay your your five dollars to get in, you know, matinee, and you uh, sit down. You're the only one in the theater, of course, and uh, movies going on. It's really cliche, <laughs> crappy stuff. Um, but the moment comes where the killer's finally going to be revealed to be Porkface. And, uh, you know, you're, uh, you, you got your, your pad out and you're taking notes because you're like, all right, what's this, what's this going to look like? And the heroine closes, you know, or turns, turns her shoulder you know, obviously this is going to be the reveal. And out of the silver screen, ripping through with a big knife, comes a squealing masked pig face. Failure. <laughs> Good. Makeup. Makeup. You're sitting in the cabin. Is that someone's red hair I just saw outside the window? No. You reach for your compact. You open it. Your eye shot is a little smudged. It's all this driving you've been doing. You begin doing a little touch up. But there it is again. That red hair just over the threshold of the window. James, the character in your story, has red hair. You snap the compact shut. You go creep carefully to the door. Whoever it is, you hear breathing. <sighs> Someone's playing a joke. Surely someone's playing a joke. You swing the door open. And you see Michael. What do you do? <sighs> oh, man. 
Yeah, yeah. All right, give me a second. <laughs> If you go down to your knees and try to comfort this child that's clutching some garden shears for some reason, turn to page 15. If you instinctually just kick the kid in the face, Turn to page nine. If you offer him some piping hot to see his lump, <laughs> um, if you say, Michael, what are you doing out here? You're supposed to be with your father. Turn to page 29. If you look and gravely shake your head and walk over to the desk and from the back of the chair, take the denim jacket and put it on. <laughs> and walk out the door with Michael. Turn to page 37. I sense an angry laptop slam coming up. <laughs> if you stand up and shout, no, 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 why can't you just tell the director to stay true to the script and march out of the producer's office? Turn to page 100. I'm doing that. <laughs> DC 11. All right. You slam the door to the producer's office behind you and you go strolling across the Warner Brothers lot. You've had enough. You've had enough with Hollywood. You've had enough with the stars. You've had enough with your girlfriend, Allison, who's a drama queen. Yes, she's a beautiful actress, but you can't take this anymore. You are done. You're leaving this town. You're taking the first flight back to Chicago, you're just gonna like, get a job at the movie rental store all over again. This is bullshit. <sighs> you take a walk around the corner and you see this movie shoot. It's, they're shooting some kind of a Western themed take on Shakespeare. You don't know, it's bullshit. You just, you just need to cool off. So you, <sighs> You decide to sit down and, and just kind of watch what's going on, watch, watch, watch the action around you. And uh, then you feel this tap on your shoulder and hear a voice that says, I don't think you belong here. And you turn around and there dressed as King Lear from head to toe topped off with a pig's mask. Ah! Credits roll. <laughs> oh my God, it's amazing. Instead, I'm going to go with Brian's kneeling down to talk to the kid holding the garden shears. All right, this isn't the end, right? There's one more. It's not, no, there'll be one more after this. <clears throat> okay, so you kneel down and try to comfort Michael, but he's got some kind of darkness in his eyes, and a, almost a 
determination to him that scares you. And you recoil a bit. And he says, I've got a new mom now. What do you do? If you, in Dia de los Muertos 4, chose to accept Tommy's mother as your own, turn to page 54. <laughs> That's the only one I want to see, so I'm going to skip. <laughs> Um, sorry, what, what was the, uh, what do you do right before this? The little boy said, you're my new mommy now. Or is it that, or is that, I have a new mommy now? I have a new mommy. Yeah. yeah. And if you... Take the ringing phone out of your pocket and pick up the, uh, the call coming in from Tommy. Turn to page 16. If you say... I have some pizza rolls for you. Turn to page 28. If you accepted wholeheartedly your role as the bride of Satan in Dia de los Muertos 3, turn to page 666. <laughs> <laughs> You're so good. I'm going to start with Chris. All right, let's see what happens. You look into Michael's eyes through dumb, stupid fucking pig mask. You just think to yourself like, this is the best we could come up with? Like, and really? A mommy issues storyline? And you just feel this sharp sensation in your chest and then this warmth and you look down and the shears are just through your chest through your lung and it fades to black <laughs> oh, well done all right what's the conclusion then I want to see where this bride tie-in goes. <laughs> yes. I'm your mommy. I've always been your mommy, Michael. Since the very beginning, you have lots of mommies. And we have been carefully watching you this entire time. 
And here you are. You finally arrived where you're supposed to be. I'm going to take your hand and I'm going to lead you into a back room where I'm going to show you something very special. Would you like that? Michael nods and you take his hand. You go to the back of the cabin, you open the door, you both look at the red-headed man tied to the ground inside the circle outlined with candles and lavender ash. This is James. He's going to be the first, but certainly not the last. I'm going to close the door, Michael, my sweet child. And then I want you to do whatever comes naturally. End. Oh, man. Nice. Yeah. That, was, that was awesome. So that good. Was awesome. <laughs> all the movies, all the meta, all the time. <laughs> Vaughn plays over the <laughs> that, was, synth. that was pretty extraordinary. But very good. That was totally cool. <laughs> Uh, cool. Um, we, have a, we, can, we can debrief for a minute if you guys want. Yeah, sure. Can I, can I just put in one little thing quickly? Is it is it okay if I do like a very quick do over for, for my last one? There's something I realized afterward. I wish I'd done. I wish. Oh yeah, give us an alternate an alternate yeah. plot line here. In the, in the in the in the producer's office, uh, after being upset about the script not being followed, the producer says. Your script is bullshit. I'm sorry, but you're not Charlie Kaufman. <laughs> and then the producer puts on a pig's mask. <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> <it's> <laughs> <in the heart. laughs> I, I I quite liked like I quite liked Old West Pig King Lear personally. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was hoping you're going to give us the alternate Totinos. I was, to say, I was about to say, if if we had time, in theory, we could go through all the alternate endings. <laughs> it's like Clue. <laughs> uh, we we could debrief really quickly. Uh, that was great. Um, yeah. I I loved it. Uh, all three were quite good, and uh, and I had I had particularly a lot of fun tying them all together <laughs> at the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant ending. That was fun. Um, so yeah, uh, just uh, hats off to you all. Kudos is very very good. <laughs> this is always such a great like weekend afternoon game. Yeah, it <laughs> just really, really, yeah. really fits. Yeah, like when you're like yeah, it's a if it's a perfect like uh, I don't really have the energy to do like full on RP right now. Yeah. but I still want to do mm -hmm. something creative, right? So. Yeah. I think it's really cool how like uh, this game supported seven people on Hangouts. Oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine playing any other game with seven people on Hangouts. Even like at a table, it's tough. But like on the internet, uh, perfect setting for that. Yeah, I, I'd never played this game before, so I didn't really know what to expect. But I'm, I'm, uh, I really enjoyed it, and. Um, Looking forward to to, uh, to to do playing it some more. Might have to uh, share it. So yeah, that's good. Yeah. Please, yeah. please don't forget, folks, that if you run games and you don't have everyone there, but you don't want to throw the game, this is a perfect, it's a perfect beat side. Perfect. Game. It really is. Yes. <laughs> um, I will time. say, um, I hadn't looked at the uh, Blood Two previously, um, but I love that to a certain extent. We now have a really, really kind of like great little format for making uh for like kind of putting together more of these because mm -hmm. i yeah. think that'd be great have, having the starter things is really handy because it yeah. gives you you don't have to just kind of like blue sky it it's yeah. great 
we, we kind of developed that format a little bit in earlier codexes where we took the, um, we kind of like started the idea of like different fail conditions and like different like little hacks to, you know, like, like different little rules to make it work or whatever. Um, and, uh, but yeah, this was like a, what I love about this one in Blood 2 is it's like a, it's a really perfect expression. I'm not I'm bragging because I wrote it, but like, but I mean it. Um, it's a really perfect expression of like how to use this game to do this thing, right? Like to tell this like arced story, right? Like within this little universe, right? The Pulp Fiction thing was identical, right? It's like use this, you know, if that had been, if we had done that with like a similar setup, like with little starting scenes and stuff and, and like little fail conditions, it would have been like even better, right? So yeah, like, so you can use this very simple game with just a little bit of like, fiddling with it and plugging some stuff into that template and make a whole new you know make a very particular experience and so yeah great fun i agree we should we should have more we should do more of these <laughs> i a think book. i buy a whole book <laughs> <laughs> same with final girl starters yeah i would i was gonna say like the that the my female hysteria page you had that was kind of the same thing like here's a, a setup you just throw one of those in every codex you know? <laughs> just like yeah yeah we we originally had that idea of just doing one in every codex but the problem with it was was we set up this precedent of like of having like full art on them right because of right. the UIOA book cover and i couldn't justify having like a whole piece of art like per Right, yeah. Yeah. right. It was like it that's was, true. It was way too expensive, but this way was great because it's like three, right? And you know, and, and in truth, it was like really, it's like six whole things across all of Diodos Muertos, two pieces of art, it's reasonable, right? So, I think it could definitely be a blog post, though. At least, oh, oh absolutely, one hundred percent. Yeah, it's a great idea for a blog post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's a great one. Um, yeah, absolutely. But I do think that, I do think there's some space to like. I would totally buy like a little book of these, like you know, like a you know, even just a PDF of it, right? Like of just a bunch of themed cheat your own adventure starters. I think would be great. And having that on your phone, like just yeah, like a drop yeah. of a hat, that's mm -hmm. that's magic right there. Yeah, lots of different like lots of different genres, lots of different tones, lots of different you know little settings or whatever. Yeah, it'd be great. Super cool. Nice. Too bad I've never heard from the author since they kind of seem to They're off the face the of the earth. I don't, I don't even know if they know how much we promote and love their game because I've <laughs> literally never met them or heard of the, them, you know, yeah. like they're just like a mystery person, like who created <laughs> this thing that we all love and disappeared from <laughs> the face of the earth. <laughs> the website's still there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, well, and, and Ray Otis, like he made like a, like a nicer version of it, you know, and try to get in touch with the guy and the guy never got back in touch with him. So he's like, well, I'm just going to put it up. I don't care. <laughs> he never got back with me. So I'm just going to do it. Right. And I'm like wondering like, man, by a, by a weird theory of like adverse possession, like do we own cheat your own adventure now? <laughs> because the authors abandoned it, right? Like, you're, you're the lawyer. Is it ours now? I don't know. <laughs> like, because he's not doing anything with it, you know? So, but I don't know. Because he could, he could, like, he could totally like kickstart the idea we just talked about and like make a pretty good amount of money, right? So, you know, anyway. <laughs> Uh, it was so fun playing with Walter and um, Brian for the first time. It's nice to meet you guys. Was this your first yeah. game, guys? This was a blast. This? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was going to say it was wonderful meeting you all. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and Brian got in on the seven dollar level uh, today. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's. Uh -huh. so I expect we'll see more of him around. But, Looking yeah. forward to, to hanging out with you more, Brian and Walter. I love your energy. So I'm yeah, out. thank you, all of y'all. Thank you. Great, great I'm, energy. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to stop this.